All right, Brian Sanders, what's going on? Hey, hey, guys, how's it going? Nothing much, just uh, living the dream here in Austin. Oh, yeah. Austin, where's that? <laughs> Absolutely. Yeah, we're, uh, we're glad that we we're able to do this. You're another, uh, we, we're, we always say to uh, like 90% of our guests that we've had on, we've literally just connected with off of Twitter. So it's pretty, I feel like out of all the social media platforms, it, it just gives you like the most direct way to connect with people. I don't know if you found it to be the same, because I know you have a big Instagram following. And I don't think your Twitter following is quite as big as Instagram, but we, you know, we've been having some good success with it. Well, yeah, Twitter is a bit different. I'm only on Instagram, but I do connect with a lot of people on Twitter and it's been great for my film over the years. Talked to a lot of great doctors and scientists and ended up getting them in the film there. Mm. Yeah. So you're, you're working on a bunch of different things right now. And I think for the audience, just a little background on you, you're hosting the peak human podcast, which is just one element of your social presence. You also have the Instagram, but you're working on this documentary too. And I think it would be great maybe just to start like with the, the pre-documentary story and what led you to that, that point of actually starting to work on that. I think that would be a great place to start. Yeah, it was a bit of a random story because I started as a mechanical engineer and I think that helped, you know, I think it's better to not come at this health stuff from a doctor research perspective sometimes, because I think they're kind of get brainwashed and put into the system. Yeah. And uh, I know a lot of engineers like Dr. Ted Naiman was engineer and Ivor Cummins is engineer and Dave Feldman is engineer. Mm -hmm. And it's like this root cause thinking, and you just think about problems in a different way. And yeah, I'm basically when I turned about 30, my health was suffering and I lost both my parents. So it was like this crazy time in my life. And a lot of people have that happen around 30. And a lot of people have, you know, loved ones pass away from chronic disease because that's just what happens in modern society these days is it's, mm. it's everywhere. It's normalized. It's just like, Oh, of course, you know, they just have Alzheimer's have cancer. They have type diabetes. They have a dad bod, you know, it's just like, let's make dad bods normal. That seems like what's what the goal is these days, just normalizing right. obesity of normalizing disease. So I just wanted to basically spread the message of this is not the way humans should live. Uh, it, it wasn't right away that I started the film. It was actually five years ago that I started the film and started getting all these great people in the ancestral health community. I think that's what I call it. You know, some people call it carnivore, there's keto, there's paleo, there's all kinds of things going on, but I'm trying to keep it high level and just look at what all the good diets in the world, even beyond the ones I mentioned have in common and what all the good diets leave out, right? And it's, it's there's sort of this simple truth to to diet and it's not one size fits all i hate using even that term because people always say, oh it's one there's no one size fits all i'm like well there kind of is and there kind of isn't <laughs> there's like a there's a one size fits all framework for what humans should eat it's like yeah there's a one size fits all diet for zebras and for lions and for you know all other animals so why not humans and, and of course we're omnivorous and adaptable and part of why humans have been so successful is because we're so adaptable and we can eat so many things, but that doesn't mean we can thrive on so many things. So uh, yeah, the film is called Food Lies, five years. It's turned into a six part series. Wow. It's trying to do a lot. It's trying to do what no film has done and kind of cover this entire topic in great depth while being really entertaining, while being interesting to the layman and Joe Cheeto. We're making this film for an imaginary guy called Joe Cheeto, who's <laughs> like in Ohio, who just kind of like eats Cheetos and Mountain Dew and doesn't know anything about health and doesn't really care. And so we want to, you know, wake him up or her if there was a Josephine Cheeto. But um, it, we're really just trying to make this uh, the, get all this information. Like I'm sure you guys have done your own research, you know, talked to a bunch of people, read a million books, studies, listened to a million podcasts, all that stuff. But you're like, well, how do I download this to my aunt? Or mm -hmm. how do you know, how do you get your sister to wake up? Because they're not going to do that. They're not going to sit there and read all the books that I've read or go to, you know, lectures that I've gone to or conferences. I mean, it's impossible. So you have to get it into a format, audio visual, just the 
the perfect thesis. It's basically right. Like it's an audio visual thesis. That's everything that I'm sure you guys agree with. And we could ever imagine getting across to someone and getting, and that's why it's turned into a six part series is because there's so much, but like, let's just get it all here. And if someone sits down and watches this, which they will, because it's super high quality and amazing. <laughs> and I can say that like objectively, because I, you know, I, even though I'm the filmmaker, well, I'm not the editor, I'm not the graphics guy. They're the ones working their magic to make it look amazing. But, you know, anyone I show it to, they're like, oh, wow. Okay. So you're doing something for real. You're not just making a documentary, you're going the extra mile. And so, yeah, that's what we're doing, getting out to the world. Hopefully, it'll be done by the end of the year and the goal is to get on Netflix so we can get the most eyeballs on it. Mm. That's amazing. that's amazing. And it's, uh, we, you know, we need people like you to really fight the good fight and spread the message because it seems like every few years, there's almost like some dogma filled vegan documentary that comes out that always leads to a huge spike in the plant-based movement. Um, you know, if you follow the money, you know, I know if you, I think a few of these have been funded by James Cameron and people that have interests in these, you know, pea plant based protein companies. But over the last couple of years, like because of people like you, and Vinny Tortovich, and there, there have been some amazing, there have been some amazing documentaries really setting the narrative the right way on food and nutrition. Um, so, you know, I know we're both really excited about it, but just curious, what made you decide to want to go down the documentary route as opposed to writing a book or some other type of form of content? Why a six part documentary? Oh, yeah, I actually grew up with a camera in my hand. I mm. didn't really think about it. Cause I just went off into engineering world and then I actually went off into the tech world and yeah, I was doing that in Santa Monica and, you know, working for tech companies. Uh, but yeah, I, I realized, Oh wait, I had one of these little cameras that had a big screen. It was in the nineties when I was growing up and I would be making videos with my brother, my cousin, like on this. And he had to like edit it in the camera, you know, you like rewind and then shoot it. Like you'd be like live editing while you're shooting. <laughs> and, uh, Anyway, yeah, I, I went, to, um, I did, took all the classes in high school. And then actually the guy I'm doing the film with now is the same guy that I've done video projects with since seventh grade. So I grew up in Hawaii. Wow. And we, so we took all the classes and he went to film school. So now he's just a really accomplished uh, filmographer and editor and has his own production company. And it's so perfect because he had the same story. He changed his life. He, you know, he's, he lost his dad. So he's just really invested in this and he's been traveling around the world with me, shooting this with me. What do the six parts look like? Is there a framework that you were thinking through when you broke it up into six parts? Yeah, I, I can recap it real quick. The first one is evolution. So we need to start back at the beginning and there's other films. So yeah, Vinnie Tortorich made Fat, a documentary. There's Sacred Cow by Diana Rogers and Rob mm. Wolf. You know, there's some other films out there, but they've never made it to the mainstream. I don't think they, you know, they, they haven't just penetrated the, the group that we're in that. Mm -hmm. So uh, you, you have to go so deep and do so many things to make it, you know, that right. good and, and reach that many people. And I don't, I haven't seen anyone do that yet. So we're using tons of studies, tons of infographics. Have you guys seen like explained on Netflix? It's yeah. Right. So they make these 20 minute episodes. I mean, it's kind of bogus. It's, it's by Vox and they're like, you know, woke right. Vox topics. Yeah. yeah exactly. Like one of the topics is not eating meat or something, you know, it's just, <laughs> it's really dumb, but they do a good job of doing nice interviews. They have motion graphics and it's like high fast pace, like good music. You know, it's all, it's always interesting. And basically we're doing that. So we're doing a really high end, uh, you know, using infographics, using science, using studies. So the first one is evolution, right? Let's go back to the human story. We have amazing uh, like anthropologists and primate guys like Craig Stanford, who's actually the protege of Jane Goodall at USC. So we interviewed him to talk about you know, that first step. And we just have these amazing scientists the entire way through the film telling the entire story of how we ate meat and fat and we became human because of it. Mm -hmm. And so that first section is about evolution then the second one is kind of the transition into the agricultural revolution and where we went wrong. So it's kind of the beginning of the end. So not many people know that once we started settling down and eating all these grains and, you know, 10,000 years ago around then we became shorter, we became less healthy, less robust, our mm -hmm. brain size, it shrank a little, we had more disease and we were just filling our diets with 
basically grains, right? It's just less nutrition. We just moved away from animal foods and fat and, you know, whatever fruits and whatever things we could collect to just uh, high energy, low nutrient value food, like grains that could store easily. It helped accumulate wealth. It helped, you know, have this rise in power and be, you know, kings and peasants and, and, you know, the peasants didn't get great nutrition and that's still what's happening today. Uh, yeah, I don't know. I, I might, I don't want to go through too much detail. So, but yeah. episode three, we, we get into more of like, what is eating and like, what, how does food work? Right. Mm. Because that's right. Right now people just think of like diets. They're just like, Oh, I'm on a vegan diet or I'm on a paleo. Like they don't know what it is really. <laughs> they just, right. they just, it's like, it's a name and it's like, Oh, there's this thing going on and I should just do this. But no one knows like why they're doing it or like, why do you eat? Like, what is food about? And so we get into those details Then we have a whole bad science, good science type of thing, which is you guys familiar with Nina Teicholz's book, the big fat surprise. Yeah. Incredible book. Yeah. It's amazing. Hopefully everyone listening has read it. It's a game changing book, but she goes through this whole history of basically bad science that was done <laughs> that made us go away from fat and cholesterol and animal foods. So that's a section. And of course, you know, Nina is leading the way. In that we have Gary Tobbs, we have a bunch of like Ben Bickman's in there. We got Dr. Ten Naiman. We got we got people all over the world. We got Professor Noakes. We got Mark Sisson. We got I mean every section. We just got like the best people we could. Yeah. And uh, even people outside of like our quote community. You know we have just amazing anthropologists that have no, you know they don't care about any diet. They're just telling us well humans ate fat and we like cracked up in bones and got bone marrow and ate brains and you know and, and like some of them i know this was one from yale professor jessica thompson she's kind of just oh yeah we should be eating you know a balanced diet of whole grains and this and that and i was like what you, you just told me we were like cracking up in bone marrow and for a million years we ate animal fat and yeah. and meat and organs and she's like yeah but you know we should eat a balanced diet <laughs> and it's so so sad because she's well Yale you know just kind of what happens when you when you work at these these universities um just fully indoctrinated it, it happens I've seen it a bunch and uh okay so that's section three section four I think I I'm, I'm, uh, section four is when we really talk about more about know the enemy because uh right now we're finding the wrong enemy right it's like everyone's like 100%. blaming the problems on meat it's so funny like when you think about it like we're blaming the problems on meat and fat when it's so obvious that it's processed grains and sugar and vegetable oil or you could even put it in the reverse order maybe it's the seed oil first then say grains and then excess we we, we say added sugar too we're not like oh no one could ever eat like a berry <laughs> or like you know what i mean like yeah, you can't exactly. eat a piece of fruit um, yeah, it's really this idea of like real food, real food versus processed food. And for some reason, that's controversial when you put it out there. Oh, it's wild. I, I make a lot of posts about this stuff. It's like, it's so wild that that's really all it comes down to is real for real food versus processed food. Yet it's basically like a psyop. It's this propaganda campaign for decades by so many people. It depends on how deep you want to go. I mean, mm -hmm. definitely the food companies and all the processed food industry but even to you know the big institutions out there just continuing this i i mean i call it propaganda it is disinformation mm -hmm. it is ridiculous to suggest that that you know that meat and whole foods are the problem and that it's not obvious that the processed foods are the problem yeah when you go back and look at some commercials from like the 70s and 80s and see what they were marketing as healthy foods like healthy start to the day is like a bowl of kellogg frosted cereal and all they say is like it's it's corn cereal with this x amount of sugar and now today obviously from your perspective we know that uh these things aren't great for you know not just breakfast but like any part of the day you shouldn't really be eating those types of foods so it's uh the evidence is there you just need to look for it and it's awesome that you are like just aggregating the information for people yeah, we're, we love putting those type of things in the film. We're trying to squeeze it as much as possible, but it's like, like get up and go, you know, with the Frosted Flakes or get your day on the move. And they had all this, so many bogus things like 
between coca-cola to yeah sugar to it's kind of like the cigarettes too it's like yeah you know doctors recommend this cigarette it's like this whole history of advertising and and marketing campaigns is insane yeah <laughs> yeah yeah even like something like lunchables brian i did i literally just did a thread on this how people don't realize you know they're they're doing billions and billions in sales to children every single year and it was literally started as a marketing campaign because baloney wasn't selling for oscar meyer so they literally just mm -hmm. found a genius way to make combinations of different types of crackers that could last on the shelves and combine it with bologna and sugar. And then they started realizing that kids were having so much fun, like putting these combinations of sandwiches together. They were like, oh, why are we, why are we advertising this to adults? We should be advertising this to kids. And now you have Lunchables, which is just, you know, if you look at the ingredient list, I think some of their products have 30 plus ingredients on it. And this is what our kids are eating, but most people just don't know the history and the story. And that's what's so interesting to us about Food Lies is it's like the documentaries that are out that you mentioned earlier do an amazing job of telling a story of like Eisenhower's heart attack and all these things, you know, the Inuit diet and Stephenson. But I don't think anyone's tracked it all the way back to like evolutionarily how we were meant to, to evolve to be omnivores and thrive off saturated fat and meat. So to me, that's a huge differentiator of what you're doing in your documentary. Oh, yeah. it It's so much more. It's like we're doing the it's basically one part of our six part film mm -hmm. is just other people's documentary and if to finish off like part five you know we we explain diets and part six well you know we demystify all diets and we kind of make sense of it all and you know put everything we've learned together and then part six is all the environmental and ethical stuff mm. so it's like part six is could be sacred cow you know part four could be Vinny's film fat and then we still have to make four more films. So mm -hmm. yeah, it's definitely a lot. And it's definitely, we're using way more studies and infographics and visual ways to explain things. And, and yeah, the Lunchables, I mean, man, we could even sneak that in the film. I love stories like that because it, it's so much of our society is just based on these like genius marketing stunts. Like even breakfast was a marketing stunt. You yeah. know, I mean, that was an average, it was like, let's sell some orange juice. Let's sell some cereal. Like, like making it the most important important meal of the day is something someone made up right mm -hmm. like people don't understand like that's a concept someone made up like in a marketing office yeah that's what i was gonna say like it's not just it's a, a team of people sitting there trying to figure out the best way to get this in as many households as possible whatever this is whatever product it is uh it, it was someone sitting there trying to craft this narrative and they kind of use the same framework too in a lot of ways like the kids is like a very common gateway for a lot mm -hmm. of these companies to get their products and their foods in, in households. And then they just become staples, which I find it, it's, and then they also use like celebrities and, and all these, like there's one Pepsi commercial that has like Rihanna walking into a gas station and there's a kid sitting there like looking at listening to a Rihanna song and then sees Rihanna walk into the gas station and is like, mm -hmm. Oh my gosh, like, my celebrity crush just walked past me and she was drinking a Pepsi, like that sort of thing. It's like, okay, uh, how do you, how does Pepsi look at that sort of marketing now? Like it's so nefarious in a lot of ways. It's so crazy. It's funny. You mentioned, um, the 30 ingredients in the Lunchables. Yeah. My favorite post. I also like to talk about calories a lot and how mm. that's just bogus. So my favorite post ever was, 90 calories sells a lot better than 30 ingredients. Mm -hmm. Convincing the world to count calories instead of ingredients was the most profitable scheme in history. Yeah. Like, just imagine that, but like, think about it. It's like, it, that's why I'm saying it's a psyop. It's like, mm. they get you focus on calories, whatever processed foods. Oh, it doesn't matter that it's processed, but it only has 90 calories. Right. Like it's insane. So they get you focused on, Ooh, this only has 90 calories well, the bag is half empty. You know, it's like these little like crackers, the bag's half empty. You're not going to be full. You're, I mean, it's almost your hunger after you eat them. It's like, if oh, you yeah. eat those an hour later, you're going to be hunger than if you didn't eat them. Right. But yet they're saying, oh, this is good because it only has 90 calories. And I'm saying, for one, that's insane. Who cares about calories? Because I'm going to be hungrier after. And all that matters is basically satiety. Basically, weight loss and body composition is a satiety problem, not a calorie problem. 
mm-hmm. right? If you eat a big steak with all the fat on it and the protein, I don't care how many calories it has because I'm going to be full for this amount of time. Mm-hmm. And it's equal. It says this amount of calories. Oh, I'm full for this long. This little bag of 90 calorie crackers, it's 90 calories, but I'm full. Well, basically I'm hungrier. <laughs> you, you could be eating more calories because you ate those. Actually, Stan Efferding's a great guy in the diet space and the weightlifting space, but his trick for getting people to eat more when you're trying to, if you're a real bodybuilder, you need to eat, you need to stuff food down your face. Mm-hmm. And his trick is to get people to eat a Dorito. Mm-hmm. He's like, if you eat a Dorito, you eat your meal and you're not hungry in two hours, eat a Dorito. You're going to be hungrier and you're going to, and then 30 minutes later, you'll, you'll be able to eat again. That's and, crazy. And, and it, yeah. And so this is, these are the tactics people use to try to lose weight. They're like, oh yeah, eat small meals, you know, eat, just count calories, eat the, you know, the processed low calorie food. Yep. And well, guess what? It doesn't work. We know that 95, 97% of the diets fail, all that stuff. And it, it never works. Yeah. And, it, and, it's, and then you, you touch on it before the demonization of saturated fat. And it's like, we try not to, we try not to be dogmatic about this stuff at all, but it's like, you know, with me, I healed my ulcerative colitis using a meat-based, you know, carnivore diet. You see all these people that are like having, having improved symptoms that are autistic kids that have epilepsy diabetics that are coming off insulin. And you're like, well, you're trying not to be dogmatic, but it's like, show, show me another approach to eating. That's actually getting, that's reversing chronic diseases that are, that are supposed to be incurable. Um, I just haven't seen any other examples of it. And it's just insane how you, you said this before you were, you, I think you said that meat is now the enemy when it's like, it's so crazy to even to think that meat is the enemy when it's really, it's always been your best friend, your biggest ally. And it's what we're meant to eat. And we've thrived off of it for, you know, hundreds of thousands of years. Yeah. You know, I'm helping a guy with Crohn's right now. Mm -hmm. And yeah. And I was just at a barbecue this weekend. There's this other guy who's afraid of meat. And it was one of the first steaks he's ate. He, his friend brought him who I know, and he, he, they like, okay, we're bringing steak to this. And he's like, how do I cook this? And I helped him cook it. And he was afraid to eat it. He's like, don't make it red in the middle. I'm like, all right, man, you don't want it to be all like rough and uh, tough and rubbery. And you know, he, it, it kind of did get a little rubbery because he did overcook it. But still, these, these people are just scared of meat. This is just like a col- um, college athlete, you know, basketball player guy just and he was just convinced that meat was a problem. And just it just it, it's insane. And and Crohn's and yeah, colitis, all these different things. Oh, man. I mean, I work with Dr. Gary. We, we do a thing called Sapien is it's just my general like health stuff. And I work with Dr. Gary. We reversing name a disease, name a problem, and we've reversed it probably. Mm. Yeah. It's crazy too, seeing a lot of these, there's a lot of athletes now who are avoiding meat, like Cam Newton, Mookie Betts, I think Canelo Alvarez maybe also is in that group. Mm-hmm. And you see their performance. I mean, it, it, it it's probably a bridge too far to just say it's completely related to avoiding meat, but you do see there's some sort of signaling there where they're trying to make it seem like, you know, not eating or eating no meat is a good thing. And like most people who are curing these diseases are eating meat. So I know I find a lot of the messaging out there from people who are in powerful positions to be a little bit concerning. Well, that's funny because yeah, the game changers, I made a YouTube film called game changers debunked. It's on my food lies channel. And it's the same length as their film. It's like an hour, 40 minutes. Oh, nice. We made it in three weeks. I, I wouldn't call it a spectacular film, <laughs> you know, because we made it in three weeks. But, you know, we had Saladino. We had Sean Baker. We had Dr. Georgia Ede. We had Mark Sisson. We had a lot of people in it. And we just debunked their entire film. And it was pretty funny because Sean Baker and this other guy, uh, Chris, uh, it, was, it was pretty funny because they were doing some comedy and they, they're basically calling out all the athletes and listing how bad they've done since they went vegan. And, <laughs> and then, yes, now people know I, I, mean, I don't follow the fighting world or any of this, but I know that Canelo <laughs> lost. You know what I mean? He, like he just like we begin and lost. That's just the consistent stories. Like all those athletes who <laughs> who did it just started dropping out. But yeah. the funny part about the Game Changers film, they're they mentioned the guy who was like the strong man, but it was, I think this was in fat or fat too. 
where the it was a strongman competition for vegan or for vegetarian. Yeah, for vegetarian. <laughs> he it was, and he actually put down the weight. We had we put this in our film too because there's some there's some audience footage. And he actually didn't even do it. Like in the Guinness Book of World Records, you're supposed to carry it continuously this distance. Yeah. And someone from the audience filmed it. And he actually put it down and then picked it up and kept going. And they didn't show that in the film. Yeah, it's insane. And then the other thing they mentioned is the fact that gladiators thrived off of a plant-based diet. And it's like gladi what people don't realize is they think about Russell Crowe and gladiator and that they were like these ripped up warriors <laughs> when I think they were really considered to be peasants. And that's why they were feeding them grains and plants and stuff like that. They weren't giving them the high quality product because they were just fighting to the death, but people don't know that. Oh yeah, they were, they were, they were like, I think they, they lived underneath that stadium. They were like basically <laughs> slaves. And also it, it would, I, I read, I don't know if it was a scientific thing or not, or just some sort of an account that it, they actually wanted them to be a bit fatter so that they could have some layers of fat so that they didn't die so easily. So they, you know, they're a bit protected from, you know, the wounds so they could put on more of a show. They look like a bikini model today, though, I'm sure. Oh. <laughs> <laughs> yeah. um, um, Br Brian, what was for you with your own personal nutritional journey? Because we haven't we haven't dug into that too much. I know you touched on it a little bit. What was what was it for you where you started to say, hmm, like just the, the narrative that we've been told about food and nutrition is just not correct at all. Well, yeah, I was 30. I remember this because I was making my own food. I was actually pretty much like food pyramid my whole life. Mm. I remember my parents were all about that. They're like, oh, get your low fat yogurt, you know, you know, sweetened, like fake flavor, fake sugar, sweetened yogurts, low fat. I grew up in Hawaii. It was a lot of rice, lean mm. chicken, broccoli. It was like so classic food pyramid type diet. And didn't didn't do well didn't do them well at all they basically had undiagnosed pre-diabetes mm. and um you know ended up with chronic disease and then for me i ended up just being like puffy <laughs> like i was just like a soon-to-be dad bod you know 29 year old whatever had chronic uh, joint issues you know i had chronic overuse injuries with my arms and wrists knee pain i had like um what's it called? Like gastro, like GERD or uh, mm -hmm. heartburn type stuff all the mm -hmm. time. I had allergies. I had, I had all these random little things and I'm just like, Oh, well, this is what happens. You know, it's like, that's, you know, everyone makes a joke. Oh, I'm old now. And you know, I can't go hiking anymore because my knees hurt and you know, you get out of breath or everything, all that stuff went away. And my friends just got into Mark Sisson's like primal blueprint and stuff like that. And they, I started seeing them just lose all this weight. They completely changed their life. And so they actually got me in on it, which is funny because mm -hmm. it just, I just kind of reversed and went, you know, just made it my life. But yeah, it all went away. Like, I, yeah, I, I made a joke or I made a post about, I have no use for any over the, any medications anymore. No doctors, no over the counter medications, no Advil, no Tums, no allergy medicines, none of this stuff. This, all this stuff went away. And people, people who haven't done this or, you know, are outside the health world, they just kind of think it's bogus or they think it's just some you know, anecdotal story. You know, you're like, oh, your allergies went away. I'm like, yes, my allergies, went. I had allergies my entire life. And they're like, well, that doesn't make sense. Like you just, oh, you just stopped eating bread and your allergies went away. I'm like, well, it does make sense. Cause see, like if you connect with your gut and, you know, like if, if you don't have this chronic inflammation, I think of it in a simple way to just, you know, throw out on this podcast. If you don't have like chronic inflammation from food you're eating, if you just take away this, I didn't have celiac, you know what I mean? Like I did fine with bread and pasta, but once I cut out bread and pasta, my allergies went away, my joint pain went away, my acid reflux went away. So it's not like I had an overt problem, I didn't have celiac, but I did, I must have had this chronic, oh, and I mean, I just lost like 15 pounds and my entire body composition changed. And, you know, I went from like a fat guy to like, my body just like changed into muscle, like without trying almost. And it's just, you don't have this chronic inflammation anymore, you know, and your body can just, so now it can handle the allergens that are in the air right? because it doesn't have to deal with me eating bread three times a day. <laughs> yeah, it's, be it's better equipped to actually defend itself against all these other things that are happening in your environment. Yeah. What, a, 
What do you say to someone who comes to you looking for advice, but they're like starting from peg zero, you know, standard American mm. diet or, or worse? <laughs> what, what, oh, yeah. What do you tell them to do because our, our thing is like eat real foods and cook most of your meals. Like that's how we simplify it. But do you have sort of a secret sauce? That's a good start. Absolutely. I completely agree with that. And you'd be surprised at how many hundreds of people have come to me over the years because I'm the, you know, the guy making the food film. Yeah. So naturally every single person I'm in conversation with Uber drivers, I play a lot of beach volleyball, which attracts just, you know, a random crowd of people. And yeah. I always get into these discussions and I always want to help them. And they're always like, wait, so you're 38? Like, what's going on here? Like, why do you not look like us? Yeah. And, and, and for, I tell for anyone who's anyone who's listening to the audio, Brian looks like he's about 25 or or <laughs> <laughs> but yeah, like I'm like, well, I made a joke too. I posted, uh, people think I look good for my age. All I did was not get fat and sick at 38. Yeah. You know what I mean? Yeah. Well, dude, you look way younger than your age. And and Saladino, isn't Saladino like 44? He looks incredible too. Yep. Yep. Like 43, got, 44. Yeah. Mark well, Sisson, 68. Sorry to, sorry to cut you oh, off. Oh man. Like, Mark Sisson looks amazing. I played uh ultimate first with him for the film. Actually, we went to Miami film with him. He was out running like 20 year olds. He was out there going nuts and he is like, he's my idol. Like I just want to be him when I'm 68. Yeah. <laughs> if, you're that, but, if you're that active at 68, like that's as good as it gets. You lived a full life. Well, that, I, but he's living, he's like living proof of this stuff. Yeah. And, and well, yeah, I mean, even just me playing, I mean, I just played beach volleyball today. I cut out, I like to cut out of work and just played for like three hours today, but these guys, they're just, they don't really get it. They can't really understand it. And when they do ask me, I do tell them. And so, yes, it, it cook for yourself is a huge one. I make 98% of my meals now. I'm kind of just not interested in restaurant food anymore for many reasons yeah. and uh whole foods hundred percent but i go a step further and i mean if you if i want to do it in one sentence i'll say cut out like replace the most processed foods with more meat mm. yeah. right so it's just like it's some of this swap it's like oh well so you were eating you know this 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 okay take the diet here i'm not going to get you on some new diet right just whatever you're eating yeah. What are the most processed things you're eating? And they're like, and they don't even think bread is a processed food, right? So like, okay, bread's a processed food. If you cut out, if you're eating one, a sandwich a day, that's two pieces of bread. If you cut out two pieces of bread and add another like four ounces of beef, you know, mm -hmm. whatever, just six ounces of beef, that's a huge switch. You just completely change the game by doing the simplest switch. You can still eat. If you like salads, eat your salad. If you like fruit, eat your fruit. If you like chicken, eat your chicken, but let's just replace these, this one, just basically empty calories, right? Mm -hmm. Even if you don't even think about gluten or Monsanto soaked glyphosate grains, even if you don't think about seed oils and any of these, you know, bad things, in essence, a lot of these things are just empty calories. And you really, if you just get rid of those and add more protein and just animal protein, you're going to do a lot better. And, and it's simple and people get it and they do it and it works. And they come back to me and they're like, oh yeah, I see it. And I see them and they're like, they're trimming down. It's huge. And that speaks to your point on satiety, right? Instead of calories where you're focusing just on eating to be full, eating highly nutrient dense foods just to be full and satiated. It, it, can, go it. Such a, it can go such a long way. Well, that's what that trick is. It's like, yeah. how do I up the satiety of my diet? We cut out the most processed foods and you add in more beef, basically, or protein. That that really just ups your satiety. It also ups your nutrient density. It also mm. ups your vitamins and minerals, Well, which is nutrient density. But mm -hmm. I mean, that's what it's all about. I love Dr. Ted Naiman because he just tries to make it so simple. And he, he's just a great guy all around. He looks great. He's fit. He's a doctor. He doesn't care about selling any products. He's just, I'm a family doctor and I just put out posts, but his thing is the protein to energy P to E. And, you know, it's like, oh, it's all about that. And we take a next, a next step. Actually, this is a big part of the film is we call it nutrient to energy. Mm -hmm. So it's not just protein. He, he can, you know, capture a lot of people and help a lot of people just saying up your protein to energy ratio, which right. basically means up your nutrient density, which basically means just eat more protein and less processed food. 
but we take it to the step of, well, protein is a nutrient, but let's focus on the other nutrients beyond just protein. And if you up your nutrient to energy ratio, uh, you're, you're going to do well, or that's just what eating is, you know, we're talking about like, what is eating? I mentioned that I think it was like section three or something like what is eating? Well, eating is basically you're, you're trying to get enough nutrients and getting that the right amount of energy. And most people, they're the opposite. They're like not getting enough nutrients and they're eating too much energy, but it's really simple because just the aggregate of the food, foods you eat, they all have a nutrient to energy ratio. Mm -hmm. And if you're eating like low nutrient foods with high energy, which is a donut would be the absolute worst thing, right? It's just seed oils, sugar, and flour in one package. Mm -hmm. If you, if you get rid of that, I mean, if you're eating foods like that or bread, then it's almost impossible to get the, get your nutrient to energy ratio correct, right? It's like they've done these studies and a lot of the, it's called the protein leverage. Well, that's what I'm saying. We're going beyond just protein, but protein leverage hypothesis is, is basically saying that they did this in all types of animals down to, to mice and down to crickets. I think one of their, their first uh, experiments with crickets where they fed them feed. And if they gave them the, a food, like they give them like a meal, like a, a meal that crickets would eat. And it had like a certain amount of protein and a certain amount of calories, whatever fat carbs doesn't matter. And if it was the correct one, they ate the correct amount and they remained the exact right size. If they diluted out the protein, put more energy in this meal and all they had access is to this meal, you know, meal as in a pellet or something, then they would gain weight or they would get bigger, whatever crickets do, you know, I don't know if crickets have like a big fat belly or anything, but they, they could tell that happened with mice and they even did it on a small group of humans. But if you, if that's what you have access to, you, basically all mammals, especially mammals eat, I think all animals actually um, eat to a certain amount of protein, right? So if your food is diluted of protein and nutrients, then you're just going to keep eating till you meet that protein need. So that's basically mm -hmm. what the protein leverage hypothesis says. And that's kind of what's going on in the entire world. If you look at anyone who's obese or entire populations who are obese, you can just look at their protein to energy ratio of their foods or nutrient to energy ratio of their foods. And it's low. Mm -hmm. It's very low. Like the, in the U S it actually was a bit higher. Uh, it, I think it went, I forget if it went down to 12% or went from 12 down to like 10 and a half. Whatever it was, it dropped, you know, a couple percentage points since, say, 1980 was kind of this line in the sand where obesity and chronic disease upticked um, in 1980. Have you guys seen that graph where it's like, oh, yeah. and it goes up? Oh, yeah. uh, that's, that's when basically the entire population just started eating less protein and more energy and, you know, the protein went down. Mm -hmm. And it's like, you could explain it. So I'm saying. We know there's so many problems with specific things about grains or gluten or anti-nutrients or seed oils, but even disregarding all those specific unique problems, just by the fact of you diluting out protein and adding extra energy, you can explain so many of the problems. You know mm -hmm. what I mean? Like just that simple fact explains all the obesity. Like if you do the math, it actually does explain why like 60% of people are overweight now. It's insane. Um, Brian, what does a typical day of eating look like for you now? I love too mad. I, I don't snack. I do two meals a day. I eat at say one and seven, one or maybe eight. Uh, I, I just crush big plates of food, tons of animal foods. I, people keep asking me what, like my, my nutrient, my macros, my calorie, whatever. I'm like, I have no idea. I've never known. Yeah. Uh, but I, I did, I just decided to do it. I put it in the app. I was like, okay, I'm just going to find find out what it is. You know, I'm just curious. It's actually 78% uh, animal foods by calories. So I don't use any oils. People just ask me today about avocado oil and stuff. It's all, you know, study 82% of avocado oil was not pure avocado oil. Same thing mm -hmm. with olive oil. Don't mess with that stuff really. Uh, but yeah, so I just use animal fats. I just eat whole foods. I eat eggs. I eat sausage. Like I, I, I'm not worried about processed foods. I mean, you know, people say processed meats. I eat processed meats all the time. I eat good processed meats. I don't think there's a problem. I think that's a whole nother topic, but I think people blaming processed meats is, is wrong. Like what's a sausage. It's just cut up meat right. in a casing. I mean, yeah. I mean, I'd prefer to not have nitrates, you know, but I mean, even nitrates, it's just celery powder. Celery powder 
is just a natural form of nitrate and that's what's used most of the time anyway. And mm. uh, I, I don't know, you could get into those, those weeds, but really I had this whole change of thinking. It's like, well, sausage, that's just good notes to tail eating. You know, I used to think the bits and pieces like, oh, that's, that's whack. You know, they're giving you all these weird bits and pieces. And then I realized, oh, no, no, that's the good stuff. That's the collagenous bits. And it has all the good things that your body needs. I mean, you could get into trouble only eating muscle meat. If you're getting no other stuff, you're getting no collagen, no bone marrow, no gristle, none of that stuff. That's not good. You want a good glycine and methionine ratio. You want what's in those collagenous bits. And so I, I, I went full circle on sausage. I'm like, wait. I get a good beef sausage. That's great food. You know? Definitely. Yeah. What a, you mentioned nose to tail. That's the name of your company, right? You're, you're, yeah. Yeah. What got you eating organ meats? Like, was that, I, I'm, that's usually a, uh, probably like the 85 yard line when you're on your animal base. Your journey. It <laughs> takes a little while to get there, but, uh, yeah. what, what got you there? Well, yeah, I don't think everyone needs to get there. I think it's great. They provide so many extra vitamins and minerals, you know, that you're not, you're not really going to get elsewhere. I mean, just eating a few ounces of liver per day, I mean, not per day, even per week, yeah. you can get amazing amounts of copper and vitamin B12. I mean, you could be vegan and eat a few ounces of liver and maybe a couple oysters and you could save your life. You could be fine. You could, I mean, I think that's how some of these populations have managed to exist. If you're talking about, you know, people like to point out these native living people and they're like, oh, well, they don't eat much meat or something I'm like, well, they are They're They're getting really dense animal nutrition when they can. And maybe they're forced to live on other whole foods. Right. But they're not eating Cheetos. They're not eating seed oils. So yeah, it's okay. You, and I, and I've seen people like I interviewed Denise Minger. She's a food historian. She's a really interesting lady. She wrote death by food pyramid. And she, she just had this traumatic experience with meat when she was younger and she just had this aversion to meat. She like choked on meat and she was just like, God, this whole vegan world. And so now she understands the value of nose to tail eating and organs and meat and fat, but she just like, doesn't like it for some reason. <laughs> and so she eats like a great, like, well, she doesn't eat any refined grains, sugar, seed oils, any of that, but she eats, you know, potatoes and fruits and vegetables and organs it's and liver and oysters i'm like that's the wackiest diet ever <laughs> but i think it's perfectly healthy for her you know if she wants to do that i'm like okay what's wrong with that diet you're getting a lot of good nutrition from animals and then you're just you know eating whole foods good for yeah. you what harry always says is there's a lot of different ways to skin the cat and um I feel like, I know this is purely anecdotal. I feel like there's a certain vibrance and radiance to someone's skin when they eat a lot of organ meats and also just raw foods in general. I noticed that I, I used to have this like bad cystic acne on my back. And I started noticing when I started incorporating more liver, more oysters, more organ meats, more raw foods, like pretty much completely healed up. And mm. I don't really, I used to have, I used to burn in the sun. I have like Irish German lineage. I don't burn anymore. I get tan. So it's purely, and part of that could be removing seed oils as well. But I do think that there is a difference in someone's skin that incorporates more raw foods and more no, nose to tail style of eating. And I think it makes sense because that's what humans have always done. And it, yeah, it has all the collagen and, you know, all that good stuff. And yeah, the sunburn too, man, I just played, you know, I just said, I played three hours of beach volleyball. I didn't wear sunscreen and, and it just turns into a tan. I think my nose got a little red today, if people can see that, but uh, I mean, maybe I'm, I'm still not ready for the summer heat and the summer sun, but yeah, it's crazy. When you stop eating seed oils, you just don't really get sunburn. Should we dive into seed oils for a second? Just cause there's, it's the, the topic of conversation these days. I feel like it, it's, it is, I'm glad everyone's uh, like all about it now. Yeah. What's, uh, I think it's probably one of those things that if people are listening, one of the first things you should think about eliminating is eliminating is all the vegetable oils, canola oils, uh, things of that nature in your diet. But I, I'm curious, when did you start doing that, Brian? And, and what were some of the effects that you saw? And then obviously any data that you have on seed oils, we'd love to hear it. Yeah. Um, you know, so it's good that Mark Sisson was in on this early. You know, he, he started writing his books like 15 years ago and was talking about avoiding seed oils and just mm. you, but he was like really into avocado oil, olive oil, coconut oil. Those are the three good oils. Those are actually fruits. 
right? So that that's useful to people. Just be like those three things are fruits. Those three things people have been doing for you know thousands of years. You can step on them and get oil out of them. Olives, coconuts, avocado. These other things you're not going to get oil without a 16 step process and hexane and a factory. So don't eat the ones that the factories involve. And yeah, I think I I really got into it. I mean, it was this progression. Like I started seven, eight years ago, and then it went to, I mean, the past five years, I don't think I've really had any. Um, I got like more hardcore the last couple of years. And yeah, I think they are one of the biggest things that could be causing the problems, right? Because, well, there, uh, actually, I always go back and forth on this because I, I really do think it's like trifecta, right? I keep mentioning that it's like added sugar, refined grains, seed oils, like these three. But uh, in, in like the thing with sugar, you know, by itself, it's not like uniquely toxic, you know, like if you, if you eat some fruit or you eat some honey, that's not like uniquely toxic. It's like your body just needs glucose, right? But I mean, you don't have to eat it. You can, you can eat protein and you can make, make it through gluconeogenesis. But that, that a lot of people come around to this Saladino, you know, is kind of leading the way on talking about, Hey, it's probably not sugar, right? It's actually probably just the seed oils is the main thing. And, and I kind of tend to agree with that. And then the refined grains is sort of in the middle where it is just a bunch of added just calories, basically empty calories, but you know, there could be the glyphosate, there could be gluten, there could be all kinds of stuff going on with those grains too, but it is kind of just an empty calorie and just another source of, of just carbs. But, um, the seed oils, I mean, I've seen my little anecdote from Africa. So I went to, uh, is actually, we overlapped with salad, you know, for a day, he was supposed to come with us. He left early. We only overlapped for one day, but we were, uh, we were hanging out with the Hadza, uh, the Maasai, and then in Uganda, the the pygmies. So they're the Batwa. And well, we, we learned a lot. It was cool. The Maasai actually, they were kind of onto the seed oils. We're like, oh, so what what fats do you use? And they're like, oh, we, you know, we use the drippings from the animal. And then th this old guy was like, we don't like, no, we don't trust the the oil in the store. No, you don't want that. I'm like, okay, good. But I also have these great pictures, not great, but uh, pictures of these stores in Tanzania and they have rows and rows, the entire aisle is seed oils. And then there's an entire aisle, it's all margarine and they have buckets. It's like hundreds and hundreds, it's insane. You, like you've never seen this all. And, it's, and I think it's ruining them. And like, as, and you see all these kind of overweight middle-aged people in the city and as you get farther away into the villages where they don't have them, everyone is just more and more in shape and looking normal. And then you get out into the bush and they're just ripped as hell and just have no problems and no disease at all. And wow. yeah, they're like, no, we don't trust those oils. It's great. Cause they're kind of tuned into it. They're like, we don't think it should just sit there for that long. Mm -hmm. You know what I mean? They, they don't like trust foods that just sit there. I'm like that is amazing. Like use, you know, cause all foods that they deal with, you have to eat right away or within, you know, a certain amount of time. So they, they kind of just don't trust that. But then in Uganda, our, we had a driver who was really obese and he, he's like, yeah, my sister's vegan. She's a doctor. She's telling me to avoid, avoid fat. I should use vegetable oil instead of animal fat. I should avoid meat. And I'm like, how do you know what's going on with her? She's like, oh, she's obese. And you know, she has problems. And then he is like obese and has problems. And then he saw what we were eating. I was with Mary Ruddick. If you've heard of her, she's a great nutrition person. Mm. And, uh, we were just, and my film director, you know, and we're just eating, we we're just eating meat and like a few other little things, you know, we, they gave us some avocado. Like we just had a few like sides and little fruit. And the guy's like, what are you guys eating? We're like, and he got into it and he, he's doing it. And he like lost a lot of weight and he was feeling great, but he just like, it's, he, it, it's just crazy that the, the propaganda has made it out to him where he was saying, and even some of the villagers were like, Oh, well, we've heard to not eat so much meat, or we heard to stop eating the fat. And I'm like, wow, this is crazy. It made it out into rural Uganda. Wow. Like, that's bad. Brian, did you find that with the Maasai tribe that the reputation that their reputation lives up to the hype of them eating the primarily milk, meat, and blood? Because I'm just curious with your experience, because I know that there are a lot of people that have tried to debunk the fact that they eat those the majority of those three foods. Um, did you, did you find that to be true or when, when you were out there? Yeah. Well, it just depends on who does it traditionally. Yeah. Mm -hmm. I mean, there's a very linear progression as you, like I said, as you get away from the city, 
the the more they do that. So in the city, there are Maasai. So we purposely stayed at a little like kind of Airbnb. It's called a homestay. And we stayed with in a Maasai people's home. And they were the modern version of the Maasai in the city using seed oil, eating fast food. They don't really have fast food. They can't even afford fast food. It's basically they, it's a bunch of like seed oil, you know, like they fry chicken in like a walk in the street. And, and they just have, you know, this like just processed Americanized food. And yeah, they were all sick and just slow moving and just, they, it was just completely different. And then, you know, we, we saw them halfway out in the villages and they were like, they were doing okay. They were older, but they were, we had this whole thing where we met with 30 of the elders and it was in this farming community. So this wasn't exactly Maasai. So I'll, I'll stray away from that for a second, but they were just farming people and they were, you know, doing okay, but they had missing teeth. They had bad knees. They, they looked, it looked like a nursing home and they were all look like American. They're like 60, 70, but they're just couldn't stand. And then we, and, but they were like, oh, we eat Ugali. Ugali is just a cornmeal. And we eat vegetables and we don't like, you know, they were kind of saying like, we don't eat too much meat and like, they can't afford meat, <laughs> but that, you know, they're like, we're proud to not eat it. I'm like, well, you guys don't look very good. And then you get out, like I'm saying into the actual, you know, rural areas and they have access to meat and they have access to whole foods and they don't have to rely on Ugali and they don't have the seed oils. And they were completely robust. They were looking great. There was a woman who was 105. At, at least we kind of couldn't get her real age. We went back and forth. Someone said she was 120. We're like, no, uh, she was jumping around dancing. Her, her youngest, youngest daughter was 90, about 90. She was jumping around dancing. Wow. Like this good, was good crazy. Genetics. And What's that? I said, good genetics. I'm just taking care of them. Uh, <laughs> well, no. And then she's like, we grew up in the forest eating meat. They're like, we just, we ate meat three times a day. We, we would trap animals. We were doing great. We don't eat you know, and it's, it's sad is the younger generations are sicker and sicker. So like this lady was so hardy jumping and dancing, and then you get down and down. And then the, her, there was six generations actually represented and the youngest ones had the big bellies, you know, they had the worms and the problems and the malnutrition because all they have to eat these days are, are pots of beans and rice. Cause mm -hmm. they've been kicked out of the forest. This is famous from the Batwa, the pygmies. Uh, Justin Wren goes on Joe Rogan's podcast and talks yeah, about yeah. this stuff, right. right? And he builds wells for them. So they're pushed out of the forest to make room for the mountain gorillas so the government can make money off the tourists and charge $600 to see the gorillas. So they kick out the Batwa. And uh, so they have all the malnutrition. And so these the youngest kids don't have that, that foundation of animal foods in their diet and they're the most sick and they're very susceptible to disease. But okay, to go back to Maasai, it's hard to find native living Maasai. Right. Because everyone's just they're just like moving to the city or they're like, oh, we got a whole sack of grain and we can, you know, eat this delicious bread now or something. Mm -hmm. And so it is hard to find. But, yes, w if you get far enough out, they are still doing the blood and the milk, you know, and like we we did get to do that with a couple different groups. And, you know, they they all gathered and it's only the men who do that, really. You know, the, the woman, they eat some other stuff and then they. So, okay, what they do is they, they do the blood and the milk. I think it's kind of like they do that for three days and then they, they will kill an animal. They'll do like a lamb or, you know, like a sheep or something or a goat. Mm -hmm. And they, they try not to kill the cow. They want to save the cows, you know? And yeah. so then, and then they'll eat meat for like a day or two, as long as then they'll go back to blood and milk and then they eat meat. They actually don't really mix them. But when we did the blood and milk with them, we had to get there early and we went in their little pen and... Uh, they, you know, they did it. And then all the guys showed up and they were like getting their breakfast, you know, they were doing it. They were, it wasn't just like, Oh, let's do this for the tourists. It was okay. Well, we need to eat. The tourists can have some, and then we need to eat. Yeah. And so like, they just do that. And then they go about their day and they just, so they have their blood and the milk for breakfast, go about their day. And then they just come back and do that again for dinner. And so, I mean, that's the traditional way they do it. And traditionally they would go off especially if there was no good grass and the men would have to go off on their own and they could go off up to six months at a time with just their themselves mm -hmm. and their little cup. And then they could do the blood and the milk and that's all they had. Are you going to be featuring the Maasai as, as one of the six parts of food lies, Brian? Uh, it'll be, it'll be a small cameo. I mean, it's not a big part of our story. It's very extreme mm -hmm. for, for mainstream audience for Joe yeah. Cheeto, but we're, we're trying to, you know, fit it in that, 
because just that little point, it's like, if you guys are saying that animal foods are bad, then why are these guys like six, three and have perfect teeth and are strong and like super healthy and all they're, they're just eating blood, meat, and milk. Like, right. I think your theory's a bit, a bit loose guys. Sorry. Yeah. Deserve some further examination. Yeah. Um, so before we started the podcast, we were talking about this, uh, sapien center that you're starting in, in Austin. I'm curious to, to dive into it a little bit. Um, what, what's been the inspiration for that? This is an, another big undertaking that you're going under with the documentary going on. Oh man. At the community center. I know. And well, and nose to tail, like I'm just trying to keep my company going, but part of it is bringing nose to tail because we're shipping meat online. It's kind of like mm -hmm. butcher box, but it's like regenerative raised in Texas and we have the organs and all that. And so I have that, which is online. Then I have my community stuff is online, right? You know, I have all this stuff going on and I have all these great people. So basically it's those two things. I want to get them offline, right? I think that's what we need to do these days is get in person. I mean, th that's what humans need like that connection just just mm -hmm. you know there's so many people that they just they're just in their apartment they're by themselves and then they you know they go out and, they, and then they just go back it's like that's not how we're supposed to live like, right. even in austin that's kind of how it is like i have all these friends we all go home to our little spot and then we like see each other in the weekends and it's super fun and it's great and then we go back to our box right and we need humans need to just get together and so yeah this it's an ancestral health wellness center. I don't even know what to call it. It's a sapien compound. We call it sometimes too, the compound, right? And oh, it, yeah. I think every city needs one of these and we have plans to do that. So if you're listening, be ready, but we're going to start it here in Austin. And yeah, it's, it's like an event center, right? We have space for coworking. We have space for events. You know, people are in town, like, you know, yeah, Paul, Paul's my, my buddy here. He kind of left right when I moved here to Costa Rica to surf. But when he's in town, we'll have an event. He comes, he talks. We can have, uh, there's an outdoor gym. We have a cold plunge. We have a sauna. We have a barbecue area. We have a fire pit. You know, this is what people need. This is like my new goal. That's why I'm trying to do too many things at once because it's just my ultimate goal in life, right? It's like, we just got to get people together. Like money doesn't matter at all if we're just, you know what I mean? Like what could be better than having a group of like-minded people and being able to always be with them. You know, any day of the week you go there, there's like 10 people you would know yeah. there. And, and every Friday we have a, a bonfire and we're just, it's like n n none of the people in my crowd want to go to bars. You know, it's like, what are we going to do on a Friday night? Well, totally. let's go to the compound. Let's, let's, uh, you know, cook some meat together and sit by the fire. So yeah, that's what we're doing. Uh, th that's, the vision's incredible because I think, especially here in Austin, there's so many people who are looking for al alternative ways of living from kind of like the mainstream lifestyle. So like you said, like, you know, what are you going to do on a Friday if you can't go out and drink? Well, there should be these community places where people can come together and you see them during the day when you're going to work out or, you know, setting up shop to do some work. Like, I, I think the idea of just like bringing people together is something that it, it does extend beyond just like the nutritional elements of a diet, but it's like, it's, it's totally part of the health picture, right? Like having these human to human engagements. What's the last piece of the puzzle? There's kind of like four pillars to the, to human health. And then there's the fifth, the four is like the food, right? Definitely the food. I always focus on food. There's some sort of movement, right? And I have my opinions on, on lifting weights and doing intense exercise, not jogging, but that's okay. Any movement's good movement. Then there's like sun and outdoors, right? Just getting that vitamin D, getting outside. And then there's sleep. I think sleep is so huge, right? So undervalued. I think I haven't been sick in seven years. I think it's just diet and sleep, mm. like good diet. And I get sleep every night. I'm, I'm more consistent with sleep than with food, you know, yeah. like I'll have a piece of pizza once in a while, but I always get eight hours of sleep. I always, mm. and, and if I miss some sleep, I, I I'll take a nap, man. I'm, I'm back at it. And then the fifth thing is the human connection. Absolutely. It's like, why the blue zones? Well, the blue zones, I think one of the least important things was their diet, their specific diet. For one, they're eating all whole foods, basically. They were all eating some sort of animal foods. They're all eating whole foods. And they all had that community and that purpose and that connection. And that, that was one of the most important parts. And people even recognize that, you know, I know it's trying to, it has this plant-based lean to it, but a lot of them really recognize that that community, that fifth aspect to being human is super important. Yeah. What's the blue zones? 
Blue Zones. Yeah, it's a famous like bogus book. Uh, Dan Butner wrote it called Blue Zones. It, huh. it's this whole, it turns this whole concept and they they pick he, Terry picked these seven places around the world where they they have a a disordinate amount. Is that a word? Dis amount of centenarians, people over a hundred. Mm -hmm. So they're like, oh, this is this cluster of people. A lot of people who lived over a hundred in Okinawa was one of them. And mm -hmm. So, so yeah, basically, it's just a bunch of places where people eat a whole foods diet. They eat traditional diet. They don't eat seed oils. They don't eat refined grains, and they have animal foods. Yeah, and, and they have a sense of community and sense of purpose. And they go outside and they they work. You know what I mean? It's all the good things. Right. And then they just spun it, be like, oh, but they're plant based. So that must be it. I'm like, that's, I mean, we don't, they aren't even plant based. Actually, Mary Reddick, who I mentioned, I, I've been traveling around with her and her fiance and, and debunking the blue zones. And she's been going to some of these places like Sardinia and uh, uh, in Costa Rica, the Nicoya Peninsula. And there's one Loma Linda in California. But uh, mm -hmm. basically, they, they don't. <laughs> Well, Loma Linda does because they're sort of vegetarian, but other places they eat tons of animal foods. And the guy was just trying to be like, make it seem vegetarian. So yeah, that's a blue zone. Sorry. Yeah, that's, that's incredible. And it's, it's interesting too, with the Sapien centers, how it's such a unique concept, yet everything that you mentioned in terms of like community meals, sauna, cold plunge, outdoor gym, et cetera. It's like, that stuff that's just always been available to us that you're just consciously choosing to bring back. And that shows how far we've gotten from our true ancestral roots mm. as a society that you actually have to go out and open up a center just to do the things that we've been doing for thousands of years, because it's so unique to be able to find them now in modern society. That's a good point. Yeah. The sapien as a general thing is just going back to our ancestral ways. And I'm not talking about living in caves and all that, but you're exactly right. Everything about modern society is kind of pushing us away from that, right? And then all these people, whatever, if they say they're carnivore, they're whole 30, I don't care, paleo, whatever it is, they're being conscious about going back to the roots, right? Of just being human. Yeah. And yeah, that, that's all we need to do. It's a simple solution, I guess. I mean, maybe it's not simple for everyone to just do it. It's pretty straightforward though. Yeah, the answer is somewhere embedded in history, right? Like there was a point in time where we didn't have all these issues. So I, I think you're doing a lot of great work with the documentary and the community center and your your product line. Like you're all over the place, but um, it seems like you're so mission focused, which I think is is uh, another part of the health pillars too. Like you, you have a purpose here, so it's uh, it's it's definitely a motivating and empowering mm -hmm. story for sure. Awesome. Yeah, man. Well, I hope, I hope you guys join me here in Austin. I'm sure you will. And for sure get everyone else on this mission together. Really? Yeah. yeah. We, uh, we draw a lot of inspiration from connecting with guys like you because we honestly just, um, I, I know Harry was touching on it before we hit the record button, but we, um, we lived together in Austin for three months when we were training for Ironman Waco. And you're talking about the, you know, the connectedness of the shared experiences, live, you know, living or, or choosing to be with someone that embodies that same lifestyle. And we're cooking all of our meals and together and training and just talking about just society and the way that things are changing. And we basically left that experience being like, we need to just find a way to get involved in the space because we're so passionate about it. So like for us, we're about four months into Twitter. And I think we have like 80,000 followers. And a lot of it's been very similar to your approach about just telling people just the stories, the history, the facts and on the food that they eat. Um, so that's why it's like inspiring to us what you're doing, because we'd love to just, you know, find ways to connect with guys like you more and just really help build out this, this great mission and help teach people and, and help them change their dietary patterns, because it's just so important. Well, I love that. Yeah, no, I've saw you guys pop up out of nowhere. And it's so great that the communities responded. And man, I mean, I popped up out of nowhere too. When I started this film, mm -hmm. I was nobody at all. I had zero followers. No, I was, it was just some random dude. And then the communities responded so well. And yeah, it's, it's a good shared mission, man. And everyone's kind of on the same page. I think it speaks to how people are really looking for answers on their own now, where there, there are all these health problems out there and people are trying to do the work. So it's no surprise that people who are telling the, the right message or, or just an honest message about eating real foods can get traction pretty quickly. And, you know, just trying to like bring, bring these stories to light that need to be told. Uh, I, I think there's a huge element of that. It's, I mean, it's all I want to do, man. It's all I want to do. <laughs> so Brian, where, um, 
where can people find you? What's the best places to get in touch with you? Yeah, I, I guess I'm an Instagram guy, food.lies, food.lies. But if you look up food lies on any of the platforms, I'm there, YouTube, Twitter, Facebook, and uh, yeah, Peak Human Podcast. That's where all the good content is until the film comes out. Got 157 amazing scientists, doctors, regenerative ag people. I always tell people go back and start episode one because there's so much good stuff out there. You can see my journey. I've been consistent though. It's been it's been over you know four and a half years. I you go back to episode one. I'm talking about the same things, and um, yeah, it's just about the whole foods and you know just leaning into protein and avoiding those you know three refined ingredients. And uh, yeah, nose to tail as well. Nose to tail got a lot of interesting products there made from regenerative uh, animal based either foods or even like soap and body care stuff. I love it. Yeah. I, anyone who's listening the Instagram page is definitely one to follow. I think you put out some of the best stuff out there on Instagram. Mm -hmm. So go check thanks. that out. Um, Brian, thanks again for joining us, man. This was awesome. Absolutely. Absolutely. Good times.